one. Thank you all so very, very much for joining the Minority Caucus's monthly meeting. I certainly appreciate you taking time from your schedule. We've got a very nice uh, aggressive agenda uh, this evening. So we're not going to um, um, delay and we're going to go ahead and get started. We're very fortunate today that we've got our mayor, John Cooper, joining us for today's call. We sent him information a few months ago back in May in regards to some demands that the Minority Caucus would uh, like for him to address. And those being, um, one was the body cameras that we have deployed. We also have the chief diversity to the officer and EEO and working with the community oversight office and community oversight board as well as a better relationship with him and the minority caucus. So today it's his first uh, meeting directly with the minority caucus, which we are very, very grateful to have him. And for those of you who are not speaking, if you would mute your phones as we move forward, I would certainly appreciate it. But having said that, Mr. Mayor, thank you very much. You have the floor. Uh, well, thank you, Council Lady. Um, I miss being upstairs with you all, uh, but then you all miss being upstairs too, but I hope we can all get back to that. Um, well, thank you for having me on. The months have flown by. It seems like a moment ago that we were doing, you know, starting out with Safer at Home. Um, and never has the city had such a crisis, really. I mean, I just... Let me spend a little bit of time talking about COVID and CARES, and then let let me go back to your letter and your great letter and go through all the things and give you a report uh, for the issues, the concerns, the areas that you were raising. So on COVID, um, there's been a lot of progress lately, not every day, but cumulatively, our 14-day average is now really half of what it was a few months ago, a few weeks ago. But now our, there's increasingly an important metric that I, every group that I talk to, I wanna make people aware of, that if we had a national response to the disease, we would all know about it, but it's kind of an evolved metric that the state honors, but, other states honor it in terms of travel restrictions against Tennessee, and that's the number of cases per 100,000 per day. So ideally we would be at or below 10 cases per 100,000 per day. Now we're really around 25, but we had been at 65 or 70. And that level of the disease is the level to that the CDC looks at, that other states look at, so we are a long way from being anywhere near where we would hope to be. Now, some states, such as Connecticut, have had incredible progress. And it's really last week, I think, registered a zero per 100,000 cases. But in Nashville, our daily average would need to be about 70 to be at 10 per 100,000. And this is the same metric that the state uses to restrict people from visiting uh, things like nursing homes. At one point, all 95 counties were bad on this metric, and now increasingly it's 90 to 93, but Nashville is a long way from being where we should be. And I think our reopening strategy, inevitably strategy, our reopening hope, is based on that metric on how many cases per 100,000 per day. Um, and again, it fluctuates and we will, uh, I think we're doing a lot better job in terms of enforcement, but in terms of our ability to reopen our economy, it's going to be driven by how quickly we can use masks to push that number down to below 10 per 100,000. Um, for a long time, we were at kind of 100 cases around there a day, and then we spiked up to many hundreds of cases, and now we're trying to it's down really below in the 200 range and headed south. 
and then hopefully we can go on from there. But that's just a quick update. Um, I hope you will agree with me that this this enforcement era that we're driven to is the right thing to do. And that masks, getting people in masks as nicely as possible, but using all enforcement necessary at this point, since ignorance is not really a defense. People know they, everybody needs to be wearing a mask when they're out in public. And we should use all the tools that we have at Metro. We wish there was a state response, but there isn't. It's every county for itself. But we have an obligation to do a good job in our county and our county I think our leadership is followed some. Um, hopefully they'll follow with enforcement as well too. But let me, if I can just, um, I'm happy to pause for questions as we go along, but let me go through the letter. Um, in, your, in your five principal points, the first point being the willingness to acknowledge the concerns of the black community and listen and that action is necessary, um, and to listen to the city's elected black representation, the minority caucus, of course. And uh, I would love to make these sessions um, regular uh, to give my report back to our elected black leadership in the council. COVID has, I will say, it makes it a little bit awkward. I'm glad to do this virtually. Normally, I would just come upstairs to the meetings. And, and with a more formal kind of establishment because of the need to do this digitally, I'm grateful for this opportunity to do it. Now, secondly, um, Sharon, you were talking about the Community Oversight Board and accountability with MMPD. Um, yes, and the time to designate funding and full implementation of body cameras, yes. I think we're on a good track with body cameras. It is being rolled out as quickly as we are able to roll them out. Starting with West Precinct, it did meet its first timetable goal for the rollout and the implementation there, and then one precinct by another, and hopefully by the end of the year, this will all be rolled out. And then let's talk a little bit about our community oversight board. Um, with the new chief, both the new interim chief and then the new chief, chief, whoever that is at the end of the national search, an excellent working relationship with the community oversight board is going to be expected. Now, we have facilitated in this office improvements in the working relationship, I believe. If you go back to the beginning, now some, I won't say problems, but some working out the relationship is inevitable. So for example, um, when there's a police shooting, the TBI, we, the district attorney and I agree, the TBI will be involved. But the TBI, whenever they show up, is in charge of the crime scene. So in our new era, you have to work out the protocol of the community oversight board being involved in a TBI crime scene because that becomes a state crime scene and there had never been that kind of formal establishment of how to work together and I know it was to the frustration. So there was a shooting on 440, for example. We immediately contacted the COB that there was a shooting and wanted them there. But I guess we had not really understood the implications of having the TBI also be there because we were inviting the COB to a TBI crime scene and we need to have an understanding between the COB and the TBI for this. All this is working through the first generation of problems. And I think that that can be done. Now, an update on the police search. This week we will announce a Policing Commission, which will be uh, 40 members. Uh, 19 of them will be African-American and new American, so about 50% of the commission, along with a path for interviewing and screening candidates for the chief. But this commission, this 40-person commission, 
It's going to have a pretty detailed mandate. And what the commission is going to do is to give a recommendation, a blueprint, a vision for the new chief in partnership with the community for what they need to do as chief. How do they need to engage the community? How to become a platform in the 21st century? Now, I'll go ahead and say to the, I wish you had the ability of the whole minority caucus to be on the committee, but then that would turn every meeting into an open meeting. And so in the end, there's going to be one council person as a liaison back to the council. And the council gets this as a deliverable too. So the council, it's not only just the mayor's office and the new chief, it's also the council working in concert together with one council person being the liaison. And there's only going to be one member from the COB in this group also. The COB is also both an input and a deliverable. But your concerns on this subject are, like the COBs, are of complete importance in Nashville. But you're also, again, a recipient of what this group's work is going to be. And it's ending, ending up going to be quite detailed on policies, on resources. How do we do diversity? What are our strategies for hiring? Um, how well are we serving all of Nashville's communities? Uh, which is an active question. And the communities are both racial and economic, uh, as well as highly impacted areas such as homelessness, drugs, juveniles. Are we good? You know, what are we doing in terms of partnering with nonprofits in combating um, the needs of our juvenile community? So this week it all kicks off. I hope that within two and a half months we will have a new chief, whoever he or she is, will use the work of this group to have a thoughtful blueprint for where Nashville wants to take uh, public justice and public safety in the years ahead. Um, moving down Sharon's letter, and I'm sorry to be so talky, um, but there's a lot to report on. There's a lot of stuff that has happened. Uh, the letter just is just before the budget. Can you ensure that a fair share of the federal funds for COVID goes to the black community? Well, pursuant to council action, which we certainly endorsed and proposed, there is this nine person COVID committee, six of the nine members of the COVID or CARES committee are African American. Uh, and I trust their work and your work to make sure that the money is fairly allocated in our city. Now it is a, it is a big challenge because w there's limited funds with the continuing confused federal response. We don't know if there's any additional money and also the state has not really committed to where its federal money will end up landing. So there are so many needs in this and my theory, I'm grateful to this most recent $10 million allocation through um, the United Way to begin to address the social safety net ripping that has happened in our community. And I think that um, Housing security and food security have to be these continual priorities for the committee. Now, to some extent, health and education, we've recognized as priorities and there's already spending in health and education. I think the council's commitment to solving the digital divide for our school students is it's gonna be of long lasting importance to recognize the city's determination to address that problem with uh, historic allocations of money. But as time goes by, we're going to need uh, for housing security and food security, I'm afraid, uh, without knowing more about the future of the disease, are gonna be a constant challenge for us to get that appropriated. But in answering Sharon's letter, um, yes, yeah, six of the nine on the committee on our committee, both the council people and appointed by me are African-American, and I think that speaks for itself, our determination that a fair share of federal money goes to all of our communities. Um, fourth, the recommendations of the Equal Business Opportunity legislation implemented. 
for more economic equity as seen as metro contracts and black business. And then last, the urgency to hire chief diversity officer. Now, that is the most important stuff that we're gonna do. So I'm grateful to the caucus and to the council for passing the legislation of having two diversity officers. Now, it is tomorrow the Civil Service Commission is meeting to approve the creation of both of these positions and add to the pay plan. Now, over here in cyberspace, I'm gonna ask Don and Alex to join me in evaluating who's gonna be best qualified to serve. And I'm gonna ask for this caucus to appoint somebody else for me. So there'll be a group of four of us in determining the right people for those two positions. But I totally agree with the strategy passed in the budget and I think endor endorsed by the caucus of separating this out into two positions. And the way I think of it is one person in HR to deal with the problems addressed by the, the di disparity study, right? How do we have a more diverse workforce in all of Metro? And then to separate that mission out from the finance department position, which is to deal with equity and contracts. So the person in finance needs to make sure that there is the appropriate response to RFPs and that you end up with what you started out with wanting you, what your intention is, is to measure, and then again, this is gonna be with the historic effort that the NAACP has put into this, that we actually get results and that we're not using kind of games in the uh, contract awarding process to not have the end in mind, not to not have the end results in mind. And if we commit to an allocation of money that ends up with my, our valued minority contracting partners, that needs to happen. And not to be susceptible to the gaming of this that basically the money is um, does not end up in supporting our mi minority businesses as was the determined by legislation and intent, and somehow it just never happened. Well, let's go hire the right person to make sure that that, in fact, ends up happening. So the civil service is meeting tomorrow to approve, tomorrow to approve the creation of both positions and the pay plan for those positions. And so then the next step will be to identify and hire those people to get to work on that. And again, I think the vision set out in June's budget uh, is um, not only appropriate, it's going to be the most lasting contribution that either you or I are going to help make for the city going forward. Now, I hope you all can see me, the technical aspect of this. So in that very important let letter, Madam Chairwoman, that you send to me, I think I'm able to report excellent progress in all areas. In the, in the letter by the Minority Caucus. I do think um, since the letter was written, you've got the Civil Service Commission having the appointments. I think we do have a different level of cooperation and working with the Community Oversight Board. I think the CARES Committee, as appointed by me and by the Council, is doing uh, an excellent job of an impossible job. And the impossible job is how can we serve a community so devastated by this virus well and enough and with the limited federal resources that we do. But I think the process of it being a joint effort between together and doing this is excellent. Um, and then, um, Again, in advance, I would love it if you would nominate and, and ask for a council person to help me, and I'm gonna ask Don and Alex to help me evaluate the specifics of who is best suited to serve in these two diversity positions. So with that, I've talked for too much. Let me turn this back over to the, our chair lady. Uh, for any questions. Well, thank you, 
Mayor, we certainly appreciate uh, your updates. And, um, and, and there has been some progress. I think that the regular meetings for us to have is absolutely in order and something that we would very much like to have with you. But I do want to say that the overarching goal and the overarching uh, theme that I think that uh, you could do for the Minority Caucus is first make sure that the Minority Caucus has credibility and strength. And you are the one that can make that happen to make sure that it serves as your executive body when it comes to issues directly affecting the minority community. This is the elected body, the highest body of the oversight of the black and brown communities. And I think with the respect that you show, that it will serve as the model for others to do the same. Um, the second thing that I want to speak to is, is that um, you spoke about our daily numbers as it relates to COVID and the mandate of masks. Um, you know that the third reading of our legislation comes up on next Tuesday, the 18th. Uh, since our last coronavirus meeting on Thursday, there has been some uh, negative um, and malicious um, news out that has been presented that has misinformed and had misleading comments in regards to a question that I asked during that meeting. And not only do I want to give some clarification for that, but I'd also like to unequivocally uh, express at your press conference on Thursday the support of the mask mandate because we must get these numbers under the level, as you said, with a daily average of 70, so we can open up the small businesses and get our economy moving back in the right direction. So I've made contact with your, um, with your office, asking them to make sure that they do um, have me on with that. So I, I just wanted to make that comment to you. As far as the Community Oversight Board, I, I want you to also keep in mind that there's a Community Oversight Board and a Community Oversight Office. And there are two different entities and both of them need to have direct contact and, and, and um, communication from your office and some direct communication with you from time to time. Okay. I appreciate that. Uh, the other thing is, is that I want to um, um, also mention to you um, as far as the COVID-19 and the money, we have to also keep in mind that uh, many of the small businesses and nonprofit organizations did not receive PPP and they are suffering. So I, I understand that the um, committee is, uh, uh, is very diverse and we want to make sure that they are doing things for the community, but wanted to know, let you know that your leadership and the political will of our leadership is very important in all of these things. And the last but not least thing is, is that I know that we have the Chief Diversity Office and, and many of the other um, positions that we have. I personally, now this is not the Minority Caucus speaking, but this is me. I find that a lot of people in those positions are gatekeepers for you as opposed to being advocates for us, especially when it comes to the equal business opportunity and other activities related to our community for you know black and brown communities and with that we need some real true advocates that are going to speak and work on behalf of these communities 
and, and we need for you to be intentional and deliberate about making sure that people understand that that's what their role is. And with those comments that I've made, I will now open um, the floor up for any questions for our mayor and after which Core and Don Majors also here for them to speak on the EBO and the progress that they have seen in a satisfactory or unsatisfactory way since that legislation was passed. Thank you. Okay. I see no hands raised. Uh, there are no questions for the mayor. There is, Madam Chair. I raised my hand. Can you hear me? I apologize, Zofat. I, I, I don't see you. Well, all we can't see night. you. Yes, I have to get all the way down. I don't see you. <laughs> I'm I there. See you. I can see okay. me. Okay. But please, go right ahead. All right. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, for being here. Um, I wanted to say something on the Chief Diversity Officer, but I have another question on, on another position. On the Chief uh, Diversity Officer, I do want to say that it will be good based on who the position reports to, because we want the position to be independent and to be able to do their work without a uh, fear of reprimand. And I think that in your org structure, want to make sure that that position has a very direct line uh, that makes it possible for them to have the authority to do the job that they need to do uh, without, without fear of uh, uh, reprimand. And so I just wanted to put that there, that that would help that position a lot. Like Madam Chair is saying, if the position doesn't have a clear line of authority, uh, sometimes it get lost uh, 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 and the position that is not as effective as it ought to be. The question that I have for you is that uh, the minority caucus uh, uh, um, also involves non-black issue. And so one of the positions that I'm interested in asking you about uh, 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 is about the Office of New Americans. And as we look into things that are happening to minorities in the city, read the, the issue with COVID, uh, what is happening in Southeast, how a lot of people are impacted in that area. Uh, we do need somebody in that office. We do need to be able to have an ally that works with the immigrants community uh, to make sure that there's a direct conversation. I know that uh, council member, a former council member, Fabian is doing a wonderful job, uh, but we do need somebody in that position. So I know we had a conversation about it in the past, uh, and I was just trying to see if there's any movement and when are we going to see this happen? Thank you. Well, um, thank you, Council Lady. Um, on the Office of New Americans, there's been a lot of interviewing and I think we're down to three finalists. So hopefully can make an announcement shortly. Um, that is overdue. Uh, we did have this hiring freeze through the end of COVID and so that did create a pause, but I'm there are three marvelous uh, kind of finalists on this. And then on your concern, which is exactly right about any fear in the execution of our policy and that the diversity officers need to be independent. Um, I want to spend some time thinking about it. I'll, I'll tell you my original concern in the diversity office function, because there, the city has tried before and failed, is to avoid the mayor's office talking to itself and only talking to itself. And that we're only going to have progress once the whole kind of government is supervised in this regard. And so I myself, I have felt that a change of tactics and having the diversity officers out in HR and in finance, but reporting back to both of us, both the council and the mayor regularly and routinely is maybe a better strategy than just simply the mayor's office talking to itself about a worthy subject, but in fact, nothing changed over the years. So this is a little bit of a different approach trying to have change. I think you and I are gonna have to hold these new officers accountable um, 
and then let's devise the way of making sure that the accountability gets results. But for some years now, I think everybody has been disappointed in the progress that we've made, and so it's not inappropriate to kind of change our tactics a little bit. And I think this is an effort to do that. So, but th thank you, Council Lady. I, I certainly do agree with you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Council Lady Styles. Very much, Madam Chair. Mayor Cooper, thank you for being here this evening. My question is in regards to the committee to select the next police chief. If there is only one council member, what is your thought process in going about selecting that one member? I ask that question specifically because there are districts that have particular needs as it pertains to a new police chief and having those perspectives would be important and only having one person might not be enough. Is it possible that there could be two council members that could be a part of this 40 person committee? Right, well, and I haven't called you to apologize directly because I know um, you and many others would like to serve on the, the committee. And Correct. I think in the end, all 40 council mem members, you know, more than half really have expressed an interest in being on the committee. Um, I think the and this will be announced this week that the you have to honor the council process itself and have the chair of the public safety committee be the liaison back to the council. And th this commission is not a replacement for the council. The council is a senior body that should demand the commission's work, both give it jobs and um, the deliverables from the commission and that it's not, it's not, it would be easy just to be a big council committee, but there is a council and the council is the body to whom that one of the bodies to whom this commission is doing a deliverable. You need a good liaison and you need the council to ask it kind of questions. But the, there was a specific demand to the, our office that it be a community-based group and not just a counselor group. And I think this is a way of both of us honoring those demands from the community. Um, and then frankly, I wanna, this is something that we're all aware of from upstairs, that the work of this group didn't wanna become made cumbersome by the Open Meetings Act. And by having more than one council person, immediately it becomes publicly noticed for a long period of time. It's open, it's a basically a media event, um, as is the public's right, of course, but that the work at least can be facilitated by having this other approach of only one council person. Um, but I do feel that um, Council Lady, you and I need to work together to make sure, and I think you'll be pleased when you see the charter for this group that it's asking all the right questions. But in the end, this group has to advise the new chief. I mean, under our the Metro Charter, the new chief has quite a lot of discretion in setting the policies with the mayor's office and in consultation with the council that we need for it to follow. So I'm not at all, uh, I, it would have been easier to appoint a lot of council people, but I'm not sure that would be responsive to the community or necessarily effective in the commission's work. And what you and I both want this group to do is to have a blueprint for the new chief, whoever he or she is, and the best way to serve the community going forward. So uh, thank you. Um, and again, I apologize for not we're, we're not quite, we've been, there's a lot going on with COVID and other things that in terms of the announcement, but I think in the end of the day that that's just, it's the best thing is to honor the council's committee process by having that person be the liaison and also one of the recipients of the commission's work. Thank you, Mayor, for responding. I'm, I'm certainly going to disagree 
with how this is coming out, I do think that while it is important to have the chair of public safety there, I think there is a very different perspective um, with all due respect to council member Poli than the individuals that are sitting on this call right now. I think it is very important that as you're still determining how this is working, that there might be some, some way to figure this out um, to have our perspective at the table. But thank well, you I'm for coming. I'm sure there, there will be, and the work with the commission will include the council. Okay. Thank you very much, you uh, Council. Chair. You're welcome. Thank um, Council Lady Porterfield. Thank you so very much, Chair and uh, Mayor Cooper. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, my question uh, is with regards to the uh, mask enforcement. Um, you know, we are thankful that. Well, I can only speak for myself. I am thankful that. Um, we are seeing more enforcement from MNPD uh, downtown and making sure that uh, the individuals that are there are, are wearing their mask and, and issuing citations. Um, my question as well as my concern uh, is with regards to equitable uh, enforcement. I'm not sure if it has been brought to your attention, um, but on this weekend, another African American man was arrested um, downtown. Now, this gentleman did have a mask. Um, they, his wife did a social media video that shows them uh, both. She did not have a mask and she received the citation. Her husband did have a mask, but he was being arrested. Um, in the video, you can also hear um, the wife asking, uh, she was speaking, um, admittedly so, she was speaking loud in the video, and she was asking questions, and an officer in the video um, threatened to, or, or made the comment, I won't say threatened, he made the comment that um, she would be arrested for disorderly conduct. Um, and again, she was just, she was speaking loudly, but she wasn't, um, you know, she wasn't aggressive. She wasn't, she, she wasn't doing anything that would lead you to believe that there was a reason to make a comment to her that she would be arrested. Um, you know, and they, they're saying, hey, look at all these other people that are around that aren't wearing masks. Why are we the ones that are, are, are getting, you know, arrested? And again, we want to make sure that everyone is wearing a mask. So this is not um, in defense of anyone not wearing a mask, but we just want to make sure that when we are looking at MMPD's enforcement of these policies, that it will be done in an equitable manner and that you won't have one population that's being disproportionately impacted, whether that's uh, due to ethnicity, religion, socioeconomic status, or, or whatever the case may be. We just don't want the enforcement to be uh, disproportionate. So if you could um, uh, speak to that, I would definitely appreciate it. Okay. Well, again, thank you, Council Lady. Uh, I agree with you, it's time to be serious with enforcement. Um, I will certainly bring up with Chief Drake the to making sure that they are enforcing the mask ordinance fairly and for all people. Um, I wanted to review a few numbers with you. I mean, I think there's a great change that started on Friday in mask wearing downtown I'm told is way over 90% currently. There were 829 warnings, this is Friday, 139 people claimed a medical exemption. Uh, 18 citations were issued, there were two physical arrests. Officers provided the subject a mask because he didn't have one, he took the mask, walked off, threw it on the ground. Officers attempted to issue in him a citation but the subject insisted, insisted that he be taken to jail. He also had an outstanding warrant. Um, now, we have here organized a working group on enforcement uh, that's headed by um, Bob Cooper, our legal director, and then Kristen Wilson, uh, our operating officer. It's important to have our legal director, I think, chair this daily meeting because it is gonna to try to use all the avenues of Metro for enforcement. So that's the beer board, the transportation licensing committee, that is codes as well. You know, it goes on and on with everybody as well as police. Um, 
Now the beer board, uh, uh, the TLC had 40 warnings uh, on Friday. Now ultimately the transportainment vehicles left Nashville and went to Franklin. They did not find a friendly environment there either. Now on Saturday, there were 1,218 warnings, 120 persons claimed a medical exemption. There were 18 citations issued. There were four physical arrests. Each of the physical arrests have uh, an entire story. I do think with Chief Drake, you know, every effort is made to be completely equitable in this. I was, like members on the council, that first business of arresting one homeless African-American man early on in this process is not appropriate to only arrest that person when other people um, clearly um, are, are not complying with the law either. Um, and then Sunday, there were 249 warnings uh, and there were four citations issued. And I think of the citations issued of four and then um, 18 um, and then 18. So on that kind of 50 citations, I'm going to ask the chief to provide a breakdown on um, racial makeup of those citations to make sure that in fact, in no way is it being um, in any way targeted on a particular community as opposed to just the people who are not wearing a mask in areas of Nashville. Um, but I agree, boy, do I certainly agree with your goal and our future is that people recognize that there's a fair and impartial enforcement of what we all agree is an absolutely critical public health protocol. If we're gonna get the city back to work which has to be just such an incredible priority. I mean, particularly now that the federal benefit may be expiring and this has gone on for too many months, every extra week that happens where people are not wearing a mask and we're in a disease condition where we cannot reopen is just a challenge to both me and to the council for having a, a getting a city back and to alleviate some of this crisis need that is happening in our community because of unemployment. So, Mayor, uh, if I can interrupt, because we do need to, to move on. The one thing that I want to say in that, and I believe that uh, Councilmember Porterfield was basically indicating that, and I know you're going to ask for the, dish, the, the demographics to make sure of the you know, portions of the, you know, impartiality, we hope, that doesn't exist um, in this. But just to add that there needs to be some, some sensitivity and some cultural understanding. You know, I know for me, I, I am a voice, I have a big voice, a loud voice, and many others, uh, like me do. So we may speak loud and because of the loudness of our voice or the convictions in it, people misunderstand it for confrontational. And, and because one thing starts one kind of thing and as opposed to de-escalating the situation, not only the, and, and, and it's an implicit bias for people to see people of color, especially black people, to make that um, preconceived notion about them simply because they're looking at the color of their skin. Well, and, and not only that, but but we are a very demonstrative and and, and animated community of people. Um, you know that, that that we 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 move. We have gestures. We do a lot of things that some people may not really understand. So taking all of that in consideration needs to be viewed. And and while we appreciate. Uh, our interim chief in in in, in uh, Chief Drake, we we also don't want you or anyone else to think that just because he is a black man that he's going to have more sensitivity because sometimes.
people of color think that they have to show that they are not showing favoritism just because they're dealing with another black person. So we want to keep all of that in mind as we move forward and make sure that we address them very objectively as we move forward with no biases. Oh, I agree. And ha having Chief Drake doesn't mean the problem is solved. I think um, you're exactly right. Given our city and our country's track record in this, we cannot be too vigilant in making sure that laws are applied fairly. And we're going to do that here in Nashville, Tennessee. Thank you, Thank you very much. Uh, I know, uh, Councilmember Porterfield, did you have something else that you wanted to say? Uh, yes, very briefly. Thank you for uh, that. Thank you for so eloquently expressing those concerns. Um, the, the other thing, Mayor, is specifically looking to address um, the, the officer was uh, uh, polite and, um, you know, the way that he was dealing with, uh, the, from what I saw in the video, he appeared to be polite. So while we are thankful for that, his um, exact statement was that if she didn't keep her voice down, he would arrest her for disorderly conduct. Okay. And he said, you can't be screaming down here with all these people. And it's very evident that she wasn't screaming. And it's okay. very, um, it was just very alarming to, to hear someone say, to, to, to say that they would arrest someone for speaking loudly. So I think that when we're looking at these de-escalation techniques uh, that our uh, department is doing, we need to make sure, uh, as Madam Chair said, that we are being uh, culturally competent and that we are very cognizant on uh, the intent and, and, and reading the room, knowing what's, what's happening. So if that is something that could be addressed and um, if, if there could be follow up with us to let us know about that incident, I would appreciate it. Thank you. Well, and thank you. I want to I get a little bit of comfort. Let me share this with you because I know of a couple of cases where this has happened. The district attorney's office has not gone ahead with the warrant when they have felt that it was somehow the conduct of it was inappropriate. And I want to thank the district attorney's office for adding and effect another level of supervision and concern on this subject. And again, I just I want to bring this up in general to give a shout out to a group that I think is doing a fine job and a helpful job in this work. Thank you very much. Council Lady Gamble. Thank you, Chair, and thank you, Mayor Cooper, again, for your response to uh, the Minority Caucus uh, concerns and issues thus far. We look forward to continuing to work with you in addressing uh, the minority business community uh, impact and concerns going forward. I have a quick question about the uh, police commission. Is there a sunset for that commission? Is it uh, just for the strategies for hiring the, the new police chief, or is there a long-term plan for the commission? No, it is as in, envisaged now, and thank you, Council Lady, it is short-term, really, to get the, the community vision done in time for the new chief, whoever he or she is, to use this as a uh, blueprint or an operating manual as a community request, as an authorization for the job we want them to do as chief. So not only are you hiring a new person, this is why the two processes are in tandem, both the commission to do the visioning and then the personnel selection, and we need both the council to be involved with me and people from this commission in finding the right person to execute the vision. So I want when the new chief is hired for them to have this blueprint that speaks for the community on lots of things that we need, need the new chief to value and get done for us. Um, but it is not a long-term work. It is the same next two and a half months uh, to go in tandem and working, you know, there is a, in a national search, there is a consulting effort. It's not that expensive. There are frankly a lot of cities looking for a new chief right now. So 
valued candidates are gonna, are, you know, are, are gonna be, have a lot of cities to, in effect, to choose from. We do have strong internal candidates here, but I think the city is best served by everybody being able to say this is the best person from a national search to execute a vision that we have put together here in Nashville, unique to Nashville, addresses a lot of national concerns. But again, it's unique to Nashville for our particular visioning for what we need the chief to get accomplished. And also for this group, I mean, the new chief is gonna have now 39 non-council people. It's gonna have 40 council people and then 39 people from this commission to help introduce them to their communities and to the city. And so having a balanced group in addition to the council to help make that introduction, um, I think is also a valued thing in that person getting off to a strong start, whoever he or she is. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Councilmember Gamble. Uh, Councilmember Taylor, and this will be our last question for the mayor. And we want uh, Mr. Coor and, and, and uh, former Councilmember Majors to speak so the mayor can be here to hear their comments regarding the EBO. Uh, Councilman Taylor, please. Thank Councilmember you Taylor. Mute. Councilman. Oh, can you hear me now? I'm so yes. sorry. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. <clears throat> Mayor, good evening. Uh, the, the question I have very, very quick. Um, I'm really concerned with finding equity and hearing from the community. Uh, I'm not sure if uh, Hub is the, is the best way to, to receive that, uh, that information from everyone in Nashville. Um, that has a concern um, for me specifically in North Nashville. Uh, what are some of the ways um, that we're looking to find equity in hearing the voices of all Nashvillians in the search of the police, uh, Chief Police? Well, um, I think this 40 person commission group, committee, visioning uh, process is very balanced across so many parts of the community. Um, this doesn't, doesn't need to exclude people, but this is formally including these perspectives. And it is, um, frankly to me, a marvel when you go through the different perspectives and part of the diversity in the community, um, I think it's it is a, it is a super group, and again, I agree with you. I worry about the hub. The hub is not enough. You can't just rely on um, people's internet facility to be the only voice. It's an important voice to be able to be inclusive to everybody. So help me also bring every voice together that needs to be heard here. And the council, particularly the minority caucus, has a deep role in helping those voices be included. Um, so again, Councilman, um, we, I'm looking for great uh, ideas for making this happen. I think people, the, 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 the balance and the breadth of the people who've agreed to be on this commission is an important step, but we're gonna to need to take it deeper than that. And the commission, again, is not the only voice to be heard here, but I want a balanced viewpoint from the commission. And again, I have heard pretty loud and clear that it can't just be the council viewpoint. People want another parallel, strong, inclusive group to also speak um, is a lot of this, they're gonna be very useful because they're gonna hear a lot of very detailed and kind of factual reporting back. 
and it's their ability to create a basis of facts, particularly in answering the Obama's challenge on an ape can't wait, is the ability to be completely factual and responding back to the community, whether we have met those eight challenges or not. Um, and you do hear, I will say, I've, I've heard different answers to this from credible parties, but I want the commission to give a good answer, the right answer, with and, and require all the facts to be known and some of the eight can't wait challenges. Well, thank you so much, Mayor. Um, Councilmember Taylor. Who, who's in the 40 commission? Who, who are the 40 people? I got here late. I didn't hear those oh, names. That's, that's going to be announced in the next day or so. I've right, spent a I'm lot of the last week talking to this group of 40 and helping to put this together. And I think Councilman Taylor was also speaking of making sure that the the citizens of Nashville had an opportunity to share their concerns, not necessarily the council. Um, yeah. I know you reiterated that they the people didn't want it to be a council driven. He was specifically speaking for the citizens. So we appreciate that. And we will even brainstorm and maybe come up with some ideas where there can be some greater input for the council. Council. So thank you, Councilman Taylor. We're going to move on with um, uh, Mr. Core and uh, Mr. Majors. If you all would just briefly share um, your thoughts and um, on our pr progress or lack thereof uh, since the legislation has been um, approved and presented to the Nashville community. Uh, well, good evening, uh, Council, uh, Madam Chair. Hurt, and I want to thank the invitation being sent out to our group to speak and share our findings and our concerns. Uh, I also want to thank uh, Council Lady Jennifer Gamble, who was a member of our Economic Development Committee and worked with us for a couple of years for having a conversation with me and sharing an opportunity to share our findings with the group. So with that in mind, I sent a presentation uh, to Roseanne to be shared with all of the uh, caucus members. Uh, did you receive that information? I don't recall receiving it. I don't know if she was going to put it on share, if she was going to put on the shared content for okay, the meeting. Well, I also sent a copy to... Uh, yes, she has meeting. it here. You, as you, okay, look, you can it, look on it. the screen. Yes. Right. Okay. Right. So if we could, uh, let's kind of go to the agenda. We're going to do a brief uh, introduction to our group, uh, talk a little bit about the goals and objectives. I won't spend any time on that, but really we're going to focus on the analysis, findings, recommendations, and we'll be opening it up for questions and answers and next steps. So next slide, please. Uh, the current uh, Economic Development Committee is one of the many standing committees with the NAACP. Listed below are the current uh, members for the year 2020 to 2021. I serve as the chair, Don Majors, who's been the co-chair for years 17 through 19, uh, is just going to be an active member. And we continue to work to keep uh, monitor the progress that Metro Nashville has in regards to making any progress with regards to the procurement. Next slide. Is that somebody that has a dog barking in the background? Okay. Basically, as, as part of the NAACP uh, Economic Development Group, is our goal is to promote, promote growth, expansion of minority and women-owned businesses within Davidson County and the mid-state area through education resources and partnerships. Our job is to lobby the legislation, both Metro government and as well as the state uh, for remedies for disparities for underutilization under of minority and women-owned business, okay, that has taken place in Metro Nashville and the Davidson County uh, for many, many years. And to hopefully for foster greater cooperation within the local community to develop sustainable economic opportunity to advance diversity, fairness, and fairness as relate to employment, wealth, lending, and business opportunities. So that's our goal and focus. Next slide. So what we've been doing, we've been kind of quiet. Nobody's really heard from us, but we have had meetings with the mayor. In fact, Don and I met with the mayor June 22nd, 
to talk about uh, these issues that we're talking about now, to also talk about the new diversity position and what type of person would be uh, the right fit for Nashville. So what we've done is conducted an analysis of, of current Metro spending for fiscal year 2020, which represents the first full year of implementation for the Equal Business Opportunity Bill passed in January 15, 2019. We compare the results of 2020 to prior years, okay? Some of those years are the fiscal years 2013 to 2017, which was the disparity study, which basically indicated that Nashville were underutilizing women and minority-owned firms and have been doing so basically since 1999 when they passed, when they failed the first disparity study again in 2004 and then again in 2018. And then we revisited the uh, disparity study to look at some of the information that was provided. And what I encourage members of the uh, minority caucus and also everybody in the council to be become familiar with the details of that disparity study. It is very important because it lays out a picture that doesn't speak well of Metro Nashville not making the investment to do the right thing. Next slide. Uh, this chart, can, can you blow it up a little bit? Well, if if you can't blow it up, then I'll just I'll just go over the numbers, and and all of the council members should be able to, to see that, based on the information that we received. That's fine. We we just go from there. Based on the information that we received, and looking at the spending. Uh, from the council of reports that finance makes to the council on every month and looking at the four BAO quarterly uh, KPI report, we did the analysis. And what the analysis showed is for the physical year of 2020, first full year of implementation of the equal bill, equal uh, bill, uh, business opportunity bill, that minorities, all minorities, uh, there was a 10% spending in all minorities. Uh, blacks received 3.06% of the total spend. Uh, Asian 1.098% of the total spend. This is this is part this is minority spend now, which is 10% of the overall spending. Uh, and uh, let's see, Hispanic male, the Hispanic receives 0.4%. Native Americans. 0.005%. So in physical year 2020, $81,936,272 was spent with the minority class. These are African Americans, uh, Asians, Hispanic, Native American, and white women. So 10% of the pie of all Metro spending went to the minority class. Go to the next slide, please. So when we look at the breakdown of the minority firms, 37% of the firms that are registered or certified with Metro are African-American. 9.25 are uh, Asian. Hispanic, 5.91%. Native American, 2.1%. 1.9% and white females make up about 45% of the certified firms in the, what I call uh, minority class. Go to the next slide, please. So for the year, for the year 2020, when you look at a percent of the spend, African Americans receive of the 81, million dollars that was spent on all minority groups. African Americans received 28.49% of the $81 million. 
Asian 10.34%, Hispanic 3.84%, and white females 56.9%, even though they only make up 45% of the certified firms. All right, so now go to the next chart, please. Okay, so one of the things that we want to look at is what is the dollar amount? So if you look at the dollar, yeah, that's the, that's the slide right there. So if you go back and look at physical years, year 2016, 17, 18, and 19, you can look at the level of spending that took place in Metro Nashville government. 636,000 in 2016, 991, I'm sorry, 636 million, 991 million in 2017, 1.2 billion, 1.28 billion, in 2018 and 1.34 billion in 2019 and for some reason it dropped down to 771 million dollars this year now i don't know if that's all the numbers are not in but that's what we reported but you can look at all minority spending for that period of time 6.3 percent in 2016 6.5 percent in 2017 5.47 percent in 2018, 4.7% in 2019, and it jumped to 10.6% this year. And I don't know if that's because of the relatively small amount that they show spending, but if you look at the, the, the chart below, you indicate, it shows that the spending stays pretty flat and that the total spending for all minority groups finally broke 10% this year, which has been running on average about 6% per year. Go to the next slide. And what I want to show is basically the same information at the top, but I want to look at down the next slide. Let's see, can you go down a little bit further? All right, if you look at spending, no, one back up one, okay. If you look at spending, this is the spending with all minority groups, which peaked at a little bit over $81 million, okay, which is just barely getting to a little over 10% for this year. If you look at spending with white females, it's going up, okay? Spending with black businesses is pretty well flat year after year from 2017 to 2020. Okay, if you go to the next slide, So basically, if you look at the first full year uh, from a NAACP Economic Development Committee standpoint, Metro National Government is failing in this effort to implement all of the recommendations identified in the 2018 disparity study. Approximately 96% of all Metro spend went to non-MWBE and white-owned female businesses. The increase that we had in minority spending was really picked up primarily by white females. So basically right now, they're the only ethnic group that's benefiting in fiscal year 2020, which is not satisfactory. There are many recommendations, many detailed infrastructural things that need to be put in place. One of the suggestions was to implement a small business reserve bank so that small business, which minority businesses are primarily small businesses, would have an opportunity to compete among themselves and have this and not having to compete with some of the larger organizations. We have not seen that fully implemented. The other thing that would help is that they were supposed to be unbundling some of the larger contracts to ensure that minorities get a chance to participate. We don't see that taking place. And the MWBE goals that they have set aside is too low to achieve the goals. You can't spend 10% of the money with all minorities and expect to see any improvement. The disparity study, which is on the next, well, let me just go through some other things. Contracts are being awarded to prime, the last bullet, to prime business where there is no MWBE outreach consideration when there are specific MWBE goals specified. And I reference the RFQ 20012, you can look at that and see where they reached out to white female-owned businesses, but no minority-owned businesses was reached out, but yet they awarded that contract. Just as an example. So if you go to the next slide. 
All right, the disparity study indicates, if you go down to where it says total MWBE, in these categories, and what we believe that we should have procurement to specify in these particular categories, the utilization of, of women and minority-owned business because the disparity study identifies what the availability of these minority-owned business within these particular work categories. Okay, and it indicates that in construction, when you take a look at minorities, white-owned business, about 29.55 percent is the availability of businesses to perform. If you look at A and E, 30.71 percent of the businesses to perform. If you look at uh, other professional, 51.21 percent, non-professional, 45.74 percent. And if you look at just plain goods and services, 23%. So what's happening is right now is the numbers are set too low. If we keep operating the way we're operating right now, my grandkids, grandkids will be having this conversation with the minority caucus about moving ahead and getting equity. Metro Nashville spends on average a billion dollars a year. And only up until this year, 6% have been reserved for all minorities. Now that's a shame in itself. And that's been going on for years. That's, that drives the wealth gap that we're experiencing. So we say Metro Nashville is failing. They have not implemented the, the program. They set their goals too low and they're not adhering to all of the guidelines and recommendations from the disparity study. And we would like, if you go to the next slide, Okay, we, we recommend that Metro Government Act immediately to implement all disparity studies and recommendations. Prior disparity study says that Nashville had not made the investment to, to implement the recommendations. So from 1999 to 2005 to 2017, we're still not making the investment. We got to hold individuals and departments accountable for achieving the desired results. You can't have a new administration come up, come in in the same establishment in place and they do nothing. We've seen administration after administration after administration come in and we get the same results. Now we've had the conversation with Mayor Cooper. I know he's interested in seeing better results, uh, but we're not seeing it right now. We also need to strengthen the EBO legislation and associate procurement standard practices and guidelines. One of the factors that we fought so hard about is prompt payment when minorities act as subcontractors for prime contractors. Many minority firms do not have the cash flow to, to operate 45, 60, and 75 days. Those prime contractors tell the subcontractors, which is many time minorities, that we'll pay you 30 days after we get paid from Metro. That's not acceptable. So, Mr. Core, I really, really, we really appreciate this uh, information because you know you are preaching the gospel, as it's been said, and we thank you for that. Um, but in the essence of time, I want to uh, uh, move on. Wanted the mayor to hear what you all had to say, but I also wanted to add, Mr. Mayor, that many of us know that the minority, I mean, the, the white female businesses are basically just put in the wife's name of male business owners, and they are truly not operating as you know, disadvantaged and women-owned businesses. They just carry the name. So again, you have more of that same type of uh, disparity added on to the fact that 56% is given to those white female businesses. Okay. So, listen. Can I make one comment in closing? Well, yes. we have listed our recommendations and we have, would extend uh, Don and I and the, and the Economic Development Committee and look forward to working with the Minority uh, Caucus uh, 
to share our analysis and our findings. One of the things I want to uh, communicate is that capital financing funding is critical to the success of small businesses. Uh, Charlotte, North Carolina implemented a community capital fund, which allows small businesses, okay, which includes small business and those minority businesses, 95% of minority businesses are small business, to be able to secure what we call SBA type loans, small business type loans with very small investment once they get an opportunity within metro government. So what that will allow is for the prime contractors not freezing them out or extending payments. So if you have a contract, you should be able to borrow from this fund to tide you over until you can receive your payment from the prime contractor. So I would suggest that uh, uh, in my recommendation that the minority caucus or the council look at sitting over and having procurement pre present their progress on a fairly regular basis because right now we failed the disparity study in 2017 we're well on our way to failing the disparity study again it's going to come in 2022 and we don't want to have the same conversation to talk about how if ineffective the legislation was when people are not putting the practices and policies and standards in place to achieve the goals and not setting the goals correctly and one last point, the use of diversified business enterprise is a misleading number, and it has nothing to do with protected class. Okay, they use small business, serious disabled. The only protected classes are African Americans, Hispanic, Asian, Native American, and white women, which have re or resources under $1.5 million, equity under $1.5 million. Otherwise, they're not a protected class. So with that, I thank you for your time, allowing me the opportunity to share our concern and why we're not making any progress is because we're not making an investment and the departments and the individuals that's supposed to make this happen are not stepping up to the plate. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Kaur. Mr. Mayor, is it anything that you'd like to say or add to um, the comments that uh, Mr. Core has presented? Um, um, am I? Am I? Um, there is, and it's very brief. It's my gratitude for such fine work being done. It's a sad to see the conclusions, but I'm grateful for Alex and Don Majors and the um, incredible work to conclusively and absolutely show what a failure we have been in the past. And let's determine not to get to 222 and fail again. And I'm grateful to everybody for creating a path going forward where failure is not inevitable, but in fact, we're gonna get to success. Thank you. I'm so glad you said that, Mayor, because <clears throat> you spoke of CARES Act money just um, a few um, minutes ago. And because these small businesses have been um, impacted tremendously, this seems to be a very great opportune time for them to receive some of those funds to get them on some good footing. So thank you very much. And this is a great segue for us to move to our next section of, um, of the agenda. And I really wanna get on uh, considering the time that has been spent. I see that council member Virtue has a question, but before she speaks, I do want to go ahead and introduce Brent Hooks and Michael Hooks Jr., who are small businesses out of Memphis, Tennessee. And they have come to speak to us about um, opportunities here in Nashville that they would like to pursue with their company. Um, and after Council Member Virtue has her question and your response, Mayor, we will move to having a brief introduction of the Hooks Brothers. Thank you. Councilman Virtue. 
Thank you, Madam Chair. Mine isn't um, a question, so I don't need uh, the, the mayor's response. Mine is just for um, a point of clarity and so that we get the, the public record correct and we get the, the narrative correct as it relates to um, the work for, for the EBO. So uh, for those that's listening uh, to this caucus uh, meeting, the EBO was passed last, last summer. And at that time, um, we, we, we had someone in that role, but it wasn't clearly defined um, as to who would actually uh, own that, own the implementation of, of the program. So the pursuit of, um, well, market term for the position now, uh, Chief Diversity, Equity, Inclusion Officer, and the Workforce Diversity uh, Manager in HR, um, that, that all came out of um, uh, conversations and the implementation of the EBO um, a, a year ago. When I was chair, I wanted to fund these positions a, a, a year ago. Why that's important? That's important to have these positions funded and go before uh, the silver service and to be included uh, in the in the pay plan because we will we won't have to um, feel that the program is stalled when administrations change. So uh, I want to thank Mr. Core, but we we have to be mindful of of the timing and and everything that the city has endured has had an impact on the implementation of this program. We have not had a full year uh, of implementation because there's no one in that role to really uh, to, to, to own the program as it relates to uh, accountability and, and outreach. And, and caucus members, I believe um, I sent, I forwarded you um, um, some updates uh, regarding this uh, last month. Um, I follow this uh, uh, with D Director Michelle Lane just every month, but with realistic expectations, knowing that we don't have uh, any anyone in that role. Um, we, we had Mr. Ashford Hughes in that position, but due to changes in administration, um, there's been a void um, in, in that position. So, you know, um, the work that we did as a caucus in getting those two positions solidified will long live us as caucus members, will long live um, any administration um, in the city. As a caucus, we need to make sure that the person we want in this position um, understand the charge and this is, this is a huge charge. This charge is much larger than any of us on this caucus, is much larger than any mayor in this city. This person, this person um, uh, is, is a senior level, is the face, is the face for opportunity for minorities in this city. And I know I'm not the only one that hear it all the time, but so many black folks feel, professional black folks feel, that there is no opportunities for them here in, in this city. So many of them are, are, are leaving. I make this point because a, a lot was said and I don't want when I hear the word failure, I, I, I want us to, to make sure that um, we're digesting that with, with proper with proper context. This program hasn't even had an opportunity to, to get off the ground yet. And that's just due to, uh, we've had three mayors in four years. Um, we, we, we had one person that was in the position uh, when the, the legislation passed less than, less than six months and has been vacant um, um, every since then up until uh, uh, we get these positions solidified and, and get someone in those in those positions. So just just keep it in in proper context and I just wanted to state that madam chair to to correct the record. Thank you. Could I, could I say something madam chair? Th okay, thank you very much Councilman Garcia. Can I say something? Madam chair? Very briefly sir. Okay. Uh, the legislation was approved in January of 2000, uh, 
in uh, 19. Six months was supposed to be put in place to implement the program and make the necessary changes. During that period of time, we communicated to the mayor's office, Mayor Briley, and also to the council members about what we saw was a lack of activity taking place then. Nothing took place. And we can't have excuses going on years and years and years. Somebody has to take responsibility. It's Metro government's responsibility to step up to the plate. If somebody's not there, somebody needs to step up. Now, I'm not putting it all on one person. I'm saying that individual department members have responsibilities. If you look at how department spends, they have a right to spend with minority-owned business. They're not doing it. So the way that the delegation of authority in, in procurement, it doesn't all take place right in procurement. There's a quite a bit of spending that takes place at the departmental level. And evidently, that didn't get communicated downward. So all I'm saying is this. Metro government has failed, OK? And if Metro government don't want to fail in 2020, Metro government needs to stand up, regardless of who does it. Thank you so much, Mr. Kua. Thank you. You're welcome. So with that, we are now going to have the presentation from um, the Hooks Brothers. Thank you. Thank you, Madam <clears throat> Chairman Hurt, and thanks to uh, Councilwoman Lee, all, all of you all. It, it, it's uh, glorious to see y'all working together. I uh, can't say enough about Mr. Coors' presentation. Reminds us a lot of Memphis. Brent, why don't you pull up the presentation? We won't take much of your time and we sincerely appreciate this courtesy yes uh i would need to be made a presenter to show the presentation okay let's see are you all able to see my screen yes awesome uh again thank you all for having us uh this afternoon we are very appreciative of this opportunity and we found it to be uh you know a great opportunity for us to be able to present our capabilities in a very short notice to a number of uh, council people along with the mayor so it's a pretty cool opportunity we'll start by a brief video uh, let me know if you can hear it. it's about a minute long can you all hear Nope. No, we can't hear it. I see it, but not hear it. No okay. Sound. Well, I'll just skip that and go to the next uh, slide just for the sake of time. Uh, a brief background about us. Uh, Mike is my cousin, and it was kind of funny when you said Make the it the screen, bro. Oh, okay. Let's see. Okay, so we're actually cousins. So when you said the Hooks Brothers, it was kind of funny to the both of us because in Memphis, the Hooks Brothers uh, started, it was a photography studio called the Hooks Brothers, which is the second oldest black owned business in Memphis. Uh, so that was pretty cool that you said that, but. Well, you know, I'm from Memphis. And, yeah. <laughs> you know the history. It's all good. And, uh, and, and so is Councilmember Porterfield. Yep. And and of course, Representative London Lamar uh, called me about you all and, and connected us through the email. And then Council Lady uh, Lee uh, suggested that we bring you all for a presentation. So you know how we do it in Memphis. Amen. <laughs> So we're very, oh my goodness, we're very appreciative of the opportunity. And uh, just a little bit of background about ourselves. Uh, Mike and I both have business backgrounds. Uh, Mike uh, attended the HBCU. I noticed that a lot of, uh, many of you uh, attended HBCU as well. He attended HBCU in Hampton, and I attended school in Nashville, which I recently graduated uh, re uh, last year from Vanderbilt, which was a great opportunity. And it, it really gave me a deep appreciation for Nashville and all the things that you're doing locally in the community. Uh, we're very active in our community here in Nashville. I mean, in Memphis and uh, want to get more active in Nashville as well. Uh, from the NAACP to the Chamber of Commerce and even the National Forum of Black Public Administrators, we always find different ways to stay involved and give back. 
this is just uh, a great way to depict our growth over the years. The company was started in 2010 by Mike, and yeah, as he likes to say, he started at the back of his trunk, which is true. Uh, from from then, he grew to uh, grew the company by hiring these two individuals on the left, April and Ronnie, and it was a three person firm firm for just a few years. After that. We experienced some great growth. And as you can see on the picture on the right, we have just under 50 employees. Uh, we've been able to expand to different cities and states. And uh, these this little graphical depiction shows some of the locations that we're working in along with our recognition. With that growth, we have been able to be recognized uh, locally and nationally. Uh, nationally by the Inc. 5000 is one of the fastest growing companies in the nation. And we were very strategic about this growth. We've established offices in Houston and in Birmingham, uh, and, that, and that has allowed us to branch out and connect in different ways while still providing quality service. For this year, uh, pre-corona, we had a plan to expand to these markets at the bottom, Nashville, Dallas, and St. Louis. And the cool thing about it is, even though we experienced this uh, pandemic we still have been able to grow we uh just landed a project in dallas where we're working with the department of transportation and we're still looking to expand to nashville and st louis uh, and that's why this is a great opportunity as mike speaks a little bit later he'll talk about some of the things that we've noted in nashville where we feel like we can provide some value-added services with that being said we're committed to uh just being a quality firm uh, there are very few firms who are ISO certified, especially small firms. So ISO is a, a nationally recognized certification that guarantees quality and quality management. We were able to work with our local chamber of commerce here who allowed us to participate in this program where we became ISO certified along with recently become a recently becoming a B Corp. And a B Corp is just an organization that basically uh, certifies that you are intentional about your activity in the social environment and uh, just environmentally conscious and friendly. Both of these organizations audit us annually just to ensure that we are uh, in line with their criteria. And as you can see here, uh, we like to uh, display our core values and and just uh, call ourselves actors. It's an acronym basically stating that we're accountable, creative, team-oriented, organized, and respectful. And when we say respectful, that's, it really plays a key into this B Corp. We like to say we respect ourselves, others, and the environment. So we, as you'll see through some of our projects, we have some very environmentally friendly projects. Uh, now I'm displaying our services, and basically we have a lot of <laughs> services, but um, we are very concentrated in the built environment. As a project management firm, we like to ensure that our services and our are um, centralized with PMI. Um, PMI's strategy and, and, and background. Basically just saying that, hey, everything we do is in an organized fashion. And as you can see from our project to program management services, to construction administration, and even GIS, which is one of the areas that we've been placing a concentrated focus on, is a geographical information system. So just think digital maps. And that, that has allowed us to expand in many different areas. As we and I'll let Mike take over from here, but this is basically showing that we've just been very tech focused with our growth and our partnership with Esri, which is a GIS tool, uh, has allowed us to go forward in that direction. Thank you, Brent. So one of the ways that we've continued to be able to grow, uh, we're an engineering firm, first of all, designated in the state of Tennessee as an engineering firm. All of our work is centered around construction, or we like to say the built environment. And we've been blessed to work on a multitude of projects, um, support the mayors, three different mayors administrations and um, um, state projects, uh, the local utility, uh, the school district, 
uh, we've done a couple hundred million dollars of management of their CIP program. Uh, one of the ways we do it is to be tech focused, and we're one of the only minority firms, uh, uh, Brother Coor, that are a geographical information systems firm. And we've been able to support the sewer system and the stormwater system here in Memphis. And uh, a quick testament is that when we started out, like Brent said, with three firms, we were obviously a subcontractor. Um, you know, uh, some of the programs that allowed us to get a little piece of the pie, that 10% that you referenced, have allowed us to grow because we were strategic about capitalizing with our partners and we didn't let the big firms boss us around, at least not every time, you know, maybe the first time or the second time. But by we got that third opportunity, we said, no, we can do this on our own. So you're going to give us a bigger piece of that pie. Um, and as a result of that, we just uh, signed um, uh, a prime contract last week, largest prime contract to a minority contractor in the history of the city of Memphis. We'll be managing their stormwater program. And as a result of that growth, we were able to go to Birmingham, uh, Meridian, Mississippi, Vicksburg, Mississippi, smaller markets, but we were able to actually prime this work where we weren't just waiting on a subcontract and them telling us what our scope of work was. Instead, many of these larger companies now work for us. So we're proud of that growth and we want to bring that growth and that and that same type of mentorship to some Nashville firms uh, as we continue to seek work. Next slide, Brent. This is an example I just wanted to show you all for uh, technical aspects of the application that we actually built. So these are uh, sewer systems, a map of the sewer systems. And before we put this together, all of this was, was paper. Now it's digital. And literally the crews that go out to these uh, sites when they get uh, complain about a clogged sewer can pull up this dashboard and be able to zero in on a particular segment of a pipe or a manhole and visually see what's inside that manhole. The last time it was inspected and they took a camera footage of it, they can visually see what it looks like, what type of pipe it is. All of the as-built information can be pulled up in a database. So this is the kind of work that we're doing in um, Mississippi, Arkansas, uh, Alabama, and, and, and of course at home in Memphis. And we've trained uh, young uh, black women and, and men uh, to do this kind of work. And, uh, you know, I was, uh, uh, amen in, in, in Brother Coors, uh, uh corner when he was pushing uh, for black businesses to get a piece of the pie because it's not just about the dollars. You know, I know everyone wants, uh, we all want the millions of dollars and the percentages to increase, but it's the, it's the people that we get to employ in the STEM, uh, in the areas of science, technology, and engineering and math. It's the success stories when I can say I hired a young brother out of TSU and sent him to a project in, in California, and he's representing uh, a, a black owned firm when he when he you better uh, throw that tsu in there you better throw it in there yeah, amen uh, uh tsu uh has one of the premier engineering uh programs Probably i'm a, 19, I'm a 1972 brother. graduate at tsu engineering school there we go and problem is it's not enough of us coming out of there as soon as they're coming out of there they guarantee a job i'm driving on i'm not an engineer and i'm driving my daughter and everybody else is young towards uh, that kind of career because you, you, you're destined to have work. But uh, is that our last slide, Brent? I think so. Like we said, we didn't want to want to keep, you know, you all too long. We just wanted a courtesy meeting to let you know that you got a Tennessee based firm that's, that's ready, willing and able to do work and ready to, to in Memphis. We just ask. We got a history of bringing other brothers and sisters along too. you know, sometimes uh, folks just need an opportunity to get in the door so they can expand their business. Well, we first thank you so much for your patience throughout the meeting, no and doubt. thank you for thank you for your presentation. And I, I have to admit, the uh, picture of the manhole I used to play in one of those when I was young. <laughs> yeah. Run well, from one end to the other to the other street. So in South Memphis. So uh, thank you. But we do have uh, uh, council members with uh, questions. Council Member Vercher. Thank you, Madam Chair. Mr. Hux, you know, while you were speaking, I had to 
to, to get your references and Van Turner out of Memphis, he said, you're, you're of good. Course. So he told me, he said, whatever I can do to help you guys. Yeah. So Madam Chair, there's a portion in the EBO um, that we haven't utilized yet. It's, it's, it's been on ongoing um, and it's already, it's already money there. Um, if they could speak to to their model, the, one of the one of the challenges here is that um, a, a lot of our black-owned businesses don't have the uh, mentorship, and they can't navigate um, the process. And some of our chambers do uh, a better job than others at hosting webinars and helping to facilitate um, the process for some of their for some of their members. Uh, I believe Madam Chair and I, I think we've been on one or two with the Hispanic Chamber, and each and every time they have um, uh, anywhere from 50 to 75 people on, on, on their webinar. Um, but um, I, I can't recall if, I, if our Black Chamber has done anything specifically um, on, on the, uh, the, the, EB, the EBO program uh, in itself. Um, uh, Madam Chair, there, there's there's funding there. If if they would be willing, um, and I know COVID has put a, a, a damper on things, um, if they could come in and, and do some type of do some type of roundtable uh, with with some of with some of our businesses here that's been asking for for the help and how to how to navigate the process. Um, you made you made a great point about how you were able to capitalize. Your your ten percent. You took your ten percent, and you then grew your ten percent to to eighty ninety percent. Now I don't know how uh, uh, how large a dividend you 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 have grown, but uh, from looking at the pictures, it, it looks quite significant. And you're you are continuing to grow. Um, uh, the commissioner out of out of Memphis, he said y'all are y'all are top notch in any city uh, that's willing to do business with you guys. Y'all will catapult um, black businesses wherever you, wherever you go, and that's from Commissioner Van Turner. So he speaks really, really highly of you guys. So, Madam Chair, um, this probably could be another meeting with you and a phone call with them if we can if we can get rolling uh, with this to get them plugged in. We love to. We we're, 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 we're available. We have, uh, we have the infrastructure in place. We just need that. We need to get Absolutely. So, but most of us are, are very familiar with the Hooks family out of Memphis. So we know that they come from great genes and stock and uh, Christianity and taking care and making sure that they Adam, see, take I'm care. From Memphis. <laughs> <laughs> I hear you though. <laughs> Yeah, I like the introduction. This is my first time here, and so, so thank you so much. <laughs> we're, we're, we're ready I, I really just day. threw that in, if for those who did not know, for them to just Google books Memphis, and you'll get it. You'll understand, and you'll find it. Did you want to say something, Michael? No, I just want to say we're, we're ready. already to say it. He said that he said they are it. So yes. I'm, I'm set. <laughs> Thank you, Councilmember Gamble. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you both, Mr. Hooks, for your presentation and the success that you're having and, and the, the uh, intentional mentorship that you're providing for businesses. I just want to add for the record that we do have a great resources here locally in Nashville. The Nashville Business Incubation Center is a great resource that helps uh, minority businesses, particularly all businesses, all small businesses, but particularly minority businesses with um, uh, training and, and helping set up finances and, and, and marketing and, and other things to help minority businesses scale and succeed. Uh, and, and you would be a great uh, presenter. Having your success story would be a great uh, presentation for businesses that are involved in that program. They have a, air, uh, a collaboration with with the airport, uh, Nashville Airport Authority, a mentor protege and, and uh, uh, emerging business program uh, that they provide training for. So we do have great resources here locally uh, and we appreciate you all sharing your success story with us. Most definitely, we're looking to that. We, we'd love to collaborate. Uh,
between NAACP, Black Business Association. I am on the board of the Greater Memphis Chamber. I'm only one of the only one of my minorities on that board. We don't have a black chamber, but we've got a Memphis Area Minority Contractors Association. We make presentations all the time and I love to share the knowledge and anything we can do. We've been fighting the same fight that y'all have. Um, even when we had uh, African-American mayors, we had to convince them to implement the EBO policies and to have a central person at a director's level that's accountable every time a procurement comes. Somebody needs to be accountable and answers why they're not any African-Americans in this contract if there aren't any, if they're not meeting the goal. So keep up the good work collectively more than anything, you know, I'm sure Van Turner will tell you that, you know, you don't you don't see this many pretty black faces get together on the same page. So you guys are, are, are really doing something <laughs> phenomenal. So you just trying to give a paycheck now, huh? <laughs> <laughs> but 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 we definitely trying to get another check. Right, but let me let me just say two things. Well, you probably know that Rodney Strong also did our uh, disparity study, Absolutely. Uh, as he did with you all, I our, our other homeboy, our other homeboy. Yep. And I also wanted to tell you that just last week I spoke with Dorothy Cleves, who I'm sure you know. Oh, who, okay, and. Um, she is trying to work SunTrust, Truist, into TSU with the internship program. So you might want to get with her. I spoke to her and got her connected with Dr. The Dean of our College of Business at TSU. And that would be a great opportunity when you talk about connecting with the HBCUs. I'm glad so, you brought up Sister Cleves. I had not yes. talked to her in a while, but as you know, we grew up in the church. Yeah, we were um, college roommates, and she's uh, also my sorority sister. So thank you all very, very much. We appreciate that. Uh, we are going to move on um, with our uh, agenda uh, that we have. Thank you, Brent. We appreciate you. Thank you. As well. So I wanted to bring up the, um, the talk about the Black Lives Matter mural. And I know that uh, Kathy Bugs from the mayor's office is on the call as well. So Kathy, feel free to, to chime in if it's anything that you'd like to say. But we uh, uh, received um, initially one application of proposal for doing a Black Lives Matter mural. And, um, and we, um, was looking at that and as we was looking at the proposal, scheduled a meeting to decide on how to work that, we got other proposals and a number of telephone calls in regards to the mural. As you know, Grace um, Gadsden uh, joined us last month with our Minority Caucus call and she's again with us today. But it has been, we looked at several locations, but it seems to me that in this Black Lives Matter mural that there are two key things missing and that number one is the actual approval from the mayor's office of the project and the funding behind it. I don't want the project to lose its luster uh, because things have quietened down now with uh, George Floyd and John Lewis and all of those other things that had everybody charged. Uh, but this is very much important to the city of Nashville and to us as um, a, a, a community of people. And I had presented to uh, Ms. Bugs and to the deputy mayor that the minority caucus should be the executive body leading this considering it is the highest body for black people in the city. And we were elected by the people in order to represent the people. Since that time, however, there have been a number of groups and a number of people who have gotten involved and, and so much so that 
you know, when you get a, a, a volume of individuals, it's very difficult to um, come to a consensus. So with that, I am suggesting to the group, as I mentioned to Ms. Bugs and to some of the people that have provided proposals, uh, I am suggesting that the Minority Caucus relinquish the, its leadership role because we have nothing that allows us to move forward. And with the ambiguity that we are receiving um, all around, it is, uh, it is um, very difficult for us to, to have that leadership role. So I wanted to present that to you all. And if you have any questions, I'll be happy to, um, I'll be happy to answer those questions, but that's the position that I have at this particular time. Uh, I think we can be a uh, support, but it's not quite as simple as I think some of those who are pushing for the Black Lives Matter mural, because it's not just getting something and painting it on the street. There are uh, rules and regulations that must be followed, like it can't be over crosswalks. It has to have a certain type of paint in order to ensure its uh, longevity. We also have to have, there should be some type of maintenance agreement uh, with public works in order for this to get done. And all of this comes from me as having done um, the, the Gateway to Heritage Project and other activities that I've been involved in. And people think that it's that easy because of what was done in DC. The mayor of DC made that decision and she put that mural down. Without us having that type of total commitment from our mayor and taking that leadership and making sure that it's done, we have a process that must be done and it must be followed. So with that, I will again say that my suggestion is that we relinquish the role that we had um, without having any concrete commitment or funding. Council Member Virtual. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'll be just uh, curious to, to hear from the administration. Uh, what's, what's the delay? What's the plan? What's, what's, the, what's the backroom conversations? Because I can remember when when we painted sidewalks down Broadway and then had to take the paint up. So um, I, I, would, I would just be curious to hear uh, the conversation surrounding it. Well, I just received a text message for um, our director of neighborhoods, uh, Director Bugs, and she says she's watching the call, but she's not able to get on. We definitely don't want that either, but she says that they are working on the project to get an answer as soon as possible. Um, I know that the mayor is still with us. I didn't know if you had anything that you wanted to add to this mayor or if it had even gotten uh, down to you or not. It may not have gotten down to him. I mean, I, I don't. Right, I know. I still see him on it. I don't know if he's muted or not. I still see the call is still on. May are you with us? So I received a message from um, Director Bug saying that our office will take on the charge with the support of the Minority Caucus. Um, I, the Minority Caucus. So we do uh, have no problem providing some support, but um, the concern that I had uh, initially is that the, that the Arts Commission had been reached out to about heading up the project. And I do think that a project that deals with Black Lives Matter should be 
in charge, it should be led by the highest body of the black community, which is the Minority Caucus. Councilmember Swall. Uh, Madam Chair, thank you. Um, I just wanted to say that I think I saw a resolution uh, that is coming up, I believe, on the next meeting that we have that has some uh, grants from the Arts Department, from the Endowment of the Arts. And one of them specifically talks about painting murals, uh, but this one says specifically not natural. So I guess what I wanted to say is whether it's possible either for the group, I, I don't have any uh, say whether we're leading it or somebody else is leading it. I think even if we're not leading it, we can provide support and I'll go with whatever we decide on that. But if such a grant is out there and they, uh, a couple of them were given for different things, but there was one that says specifically murals are in North Nashville. And so maybe that is something that the group can look into and see if maybe something like that could be available for a project such as, such as this. So I did talk to Caroline uh, Vincent, who is the executive director of the Arts Commission, and while that was there, and I, I saw that same information, she did not commit. She said that they may be able to look for and try to find funding, but she did not commit for funding and and you don't want just any artist to 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 paint you want artists who are uh, skilled and know exactly what it is that they're doing because you want a quality piece of art and That's one true. that will be lasting and one that uh, people can appreciate uh, council member uh, Vercher. thank you council member Swara. Madam Chair, I'm, I'm, I'm indifferent because uh, it, it sounds like um, no one is really wanting to, to fully commit um, towards the, uh, 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 the Black Lives Matters uh, mural. Um, and, and such a feat like this, when you look at other cities, if it's done in a, in a, collaborative, uh, a collaborative spirit, and because everything is already so so emotionally charged, um, I'll just follow your lead. However you feel, we we should go um, as a caucus in this matter. I don't want I don't want us putting out there. Um, you know, murals are are more than just just art. You know, they are they speak to people's spirits. They speak to people's trials. They provide they provide hope. And um, if we if we don't have that commitment from 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 our arts co um, commission and, and, and from our city, um, uh, social justice isn't 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 going anywhere. Uh, we can always um, bring bring this bring this matter back and and, and lead the charge in collaboration um, with some of our other allies in, in, in the city. Thank you um, very much. I appreciate that. Um, Ms. Gatson? Well, thank you. I want to thank you all for considering the proposal that we brought to you, particularly from the one group, March for Justice. We've held several of the actions and rallies over the past couple of months. And just to bring you up to date, uh, we did uh, get down to the final ask, which is we first came to you just for support, just for your spiritual and and councilmatic uh, support, particularly as the as the caucus that represents uh, Black people here in Nashville and the, the minority uh, community. Uh, one of the things that we we look forward to the two asks are permission from the city and getting the streets closed, and of course, uh, you know, the ability to understand what the paint is. And if we could get that paint, one of the things about funding is that uh, even though we started this with you all about a month ago, in the meantime, we have done some outreach for funding. And so, uh, so a lot of that is being firmed up in order to support this. I just want to let you know, one of the things, like I said, that we look forward to was your support. And and if there was any other help that you you could give, that was certainly welcome, and I would I I personally 
would love the, the leadership of our minority caucus here in Nashville. And Councilwoman Virtue, I, I agree with you. Sometimes we we may have to revisit this at, at the appropriate time because social justice is ongoing. And like you said, it does a project like this speaks to the heart of the people. And we want to do this to amplify the moment, amplify the movement. Um, so, um, like you said, there was a number of groups that came forward because like minds think alike. And, you know, I think we are all of good hearts in trying to get this done. And so we got to enjoy a process. And here we are in this process. And, uh, and I'm so glad that um, Mayor Cooper was available. And uh, if you do, if you feel like continuing that conversation, that would be great because we need the city's support because it is it is on city streets. But once again, we wanted to take advantage of allowing people's hearts to rise at a time when so much is going on. What are we getting out of all this movement work that, that's happening today? We need markers to show us some kind of progress. And I, I'm, I'm so glad that you allowed me to be on this meeting because I found part of my, my village in, uh, in Mr. Coors and the Hooks Brothers presentation. You know, what we do hopefully uh, continues to uplift what our needs are and they presented those needs. And so our outward actions at these rallies is designed to support those needs. We have to let people know we're not satisfied with the status quo that they've given us for the past hundred years. And like I said before, the mural is merely a visible manifestation of our intent. Thank you. Thank you very much. And and as I spoke to you earlier, um, and I told you, uh, you know, the location is key, and I understand um, the the charge that uh, uh, emotional charge that a lot of people wanted and needed, and, and wanted it to be in front of the um, um, the Capitol. Uh, but because there are things. Um, there and the state preempts what metro does i'm not exactly sure if that will work so so it might be an easier thing to do by moving it down the street you know or around the corner or somewhere else where we have full jurisdiction and and there will not be a, a major concern for that so all of those things must be in con, you know considered before it's all done and and again just the time and energy and because some people are just insistent that it's going to be at this particular place and they just don't understand that just because they say it that it just can't get done like that yes um you know, uh, but again, I know that, I, I mean, I received a um, uh, text message from Director Bugs, and she's very much on board and willing to help and work and move forward. And I think that the Minority Caucus would be willing to do the uh, exact same, but it's gonna have to be a collaborative effort. We're gonna have to work together. We're gonna have to agree to disagree but come out and make sure that the outcome is the most important thing and not necessarily who does it because it's going to take us all to get it done in one way or another. Okay. Thank you so much. As we move on to the next agenda item, we have a treasurer's report. I know that uh, at our last meeting, Council Member Sepulveda indicated that she was just overwhelmed and would not be able to continue um, as she thought before. Um, didn't know for sure if um, she had had an opportunity to get that information off to uh you council member virtue because i know you agreed to step in uh has that transition been done uh no madam chair 
Is it anything you would like to report, Council Member Sepulveda? No, I think she must have had to get off the call. Oh, no, here she is. Council Member Sepulveda, is it anything that you would like to um, report or say? You're on mute if you... Sorry, I just logged on. Uh, I, I'm sorry, I, I had to step away for a bit. Did you call my name, Madam Chair? Yes, I did. I, in terms of the treasurer's report, I know at the last meeting you spoke that you had been so overwhelmed and so much going on that you don't think that you would be able to continue in the role of treasurer. And Councilmember Virtue indicated that she would step in and take it over. And I just, and I asked if the transition had been made and we found out that it had not. So I was just giving you an opportunity to say anything if you wanted or needed to. Got it. Uh, no, Madam Chair, I, I, I don't have a, a report. Um, I will be um, facilitating that transition in these next couple of days. Madam Chair, what we'll do, we'll, because uh, she'll have to get boarding in, we'll get boarding clean, and then we'll transition it over. Um, because I believe uh, y'all have authorized it too, so uh, she'll need to do all that before transit. But we'll, we'll, we'll have it before, we'll have it by the next caucus meeting. Okay, thank you. So uh, we've got two more items and we will be shutting down. The next item I want to present is the renaming of Hadley Park. So I had been contacted by Joshua Black, and some people know him as Joshua Lipscomb, about renaming uh, Hadley Park. He was the gentleman that was on television last year, year before last, wanting to rename it Malcolm X. But he's come back, and we've uh, talked and talked about renaming the park to Nashville Freedom Riders. And, um, and, and that seems to be something several people have uh, wanted. I know he spoke with Representative Harold Love. So with his uh, information and, and the research and the petition and the work that he had done, I wrote a letter to uh, the director of Parks. And, and, and I met with Parks uh, last week and presented the uh, proposal to have the renaming of Hadley Park. And um, I got the, the guidelines in doing so. So what they did was deferred it to the, the uh, renaming, the naming committee. And in that, no elected official can make that particular request, but the body as a minority caucus could. And I was suggesting that we make the request as a group that the name be changed. I can tell you that several members of the commission were very happy in, um, with the presentation that I made, and they basically told me what needed to be done in terms of sending letters to the commission, recommending that it be changed to um, Nashville Freedom Riders, and of course, coming off of the Black Lives Movement and John John Lewis's uh, death, this again is a legacy that we have right here. And much of that was recognized during all of the celebrations and honor of John Lewis. And I think this is the perfect time. And even, and I, as I told the Parks Board, there was concern about last year whether it was named after slave owner Hadley Park after Dr. William Hadley, who uh, was a black man. And of course, you know, the park was the first public park built for African Americans in the country. But we know that if it were after Dr. Hadley, he was named after the slave owner. So, 
either way it goes, Hadley Park is still carrying the name of the slave owner. And to honor our Nashville Freedom Riders, this would be an awesome thing. And if you have not been to the park uh, or, or hadn't been lately, just go inside of the park um, lobby and see all of that beautiful history about the civil rights movement and what Black America, uh, Black Nashville was about during that time. And it is very befitting and particularly timing for us to rename this park. So I would love if someone would make a motion to rename the park or for us to send a letter requesting that the park be renamed Hadley Park. So more. <laughs> Second. So uh, it has been properly moved and seconded that the Minority Caucus will submit a letter requesting that the Hadley Park be renamed to National Freedom Riders. Any questions? Discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Mm -hmm. Aye. I think I need one more to, to have it on, to, to have a majority. Aye. Aye. Thank you very much. Any opposed? There being none, thank you very much. Um, Rosie, would you please um, send that letter that you sent to the Parks Board, send it to the commissioners as the Minority Caucus. And if we could encourage our constituents to send um, a similar letter or just ask that they support renaming of Hadley Park would be great. We can bombard them with emails like they have bombard us. The second issue is the John Lewis Way. And I know that Councilmember Suara has been working very diligently on that. Would you give us an update on that project, please? <laughs> Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, so the con conversation started um, after Congressman Lewis passed away, and we're at the point where we're looking at renaming Fifth Avenue uh, to Representative John Lewis Way. The idea is to start from uh, James Robertson Parkway and to take it all the way to Broadway. Uh, but last week I got uh, word that the Ryman Auditorium does not mind the naming. And so if they are not opposed to it, we might actually take it all the way to the convention center. Uh, so at this point, we have a nine member uh, committee that will start working on it. Our first meeting is tomorrow night. Uh, so it's myself, uh, Susan Hoggins, uh, Greg Bailey, uh, Senator Brenda Gilmore, Richard McDonald is with the uh, Chamber of Commerce, uh, Tim Walker uh, with the um, I forgot where is it now. Uh, Tom Tom Turner uh, and Mary Swain. Uh, those are the people that we have there right now. Uh, and the idea is that uh, when I talk to public works, uh, we have to get consent from everybody that owns the property on the street. So it's a very massive undertaking. Uh, and so that's why we needed some people in the community. So these individuals are uh, big name people that works downtown, the downtown uh, partnership uh, with the Miss um, Mary Sewin is with uh, the museum and she's also with the uh, tourism department. And so these are people that work downtown that can help us get the the consent of the people. Uh, the response has been very good so far. Everybody's excited to be on the committee and everybody is ready to do what needs to be done. Uh, I spoke to Miss Vivian Willard and Ms. Willard has provided me with a list of all the property owners uh, on Fifth Avenue. And so the next step will be for uh, us to meet tomorrow and talk about how we will go ahead uh, uh, and be go ahead and looking at it. Mr. Tim Walker, who is with the Historical Commission, also said that his uh, uh, organization, his department will be doing a research that will be presented on that. So it's it's all going. Um, it's only myself on the committee because when the name changing happens, it will have to be through uh, an ordinance. And so 
we cannot have too many council members on there. Also, right now, we also think that since it's in the initial stage, uh, let's just make it where we don't have to do the open meeting hand until we know where we're going, and then we'll open it up more for notice and for meeting. But uh, everybody right now seems to be eager to do it. Uh, everybody recognized the input of Congressman John Lewis, and everybody wants something. Uh, 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 and Madam Chair has been very helpful uh, and so in making sure that we get this done. I need to say that this project, um, I'm the liaison, I'm doing it on behalf of the Minority Caucus. And so it's very important that, and everybody knows that. Uh, and so the letter that I sent to the committee is that this is a project of the Minority Caucus. The Minority Caucus is leading this. I just happen to be the liaison that is helping to, to um, make it happen and the way that we will let the public know is that every time we have a meeting i'll be discussing this with the caucus during our meeting so that at least we can have inputs there and maybe at some point we might have members of the committee or public uh, come and talk at the caucus meeting as we progress uh, but it's going to be a huge undertaking it's a lot of properties uh, but there's excitement and we're hoping that we won't have much roadblock thank you Thank you very much. That is awesome, awesome news and great work. Does anyone else have uh, a question or a comment? Yes, Councilmember Porterfield. Uh, thank you so much, Madam Chair. Uh, Councilwoman Sorrell, thank you so much for your hard work on this um, and, and your passion and drive to get this done on behalf of the caucus. So I know this is uh, a lot to do. So thank you for your commitment to it. Any other questions or comments? Well, I am a blue person and I have grown and said that I wasn't going to say anything. But since I am a blue person and I know that my other fellow blue people would not like it, I just wanted to tell you all that today is my birthday. And I thank you. Oh, happy birthday. Happy birthday. birthday. Happy birthday. Happy You would have been upset if I had cut the meeting off and did not tell you and then you didn't have a chance to say it. So I just wanted to let you all know, but my family is here and my husband has fixed dinner and my children are here and I'm really excited. So thank you all very much. I think this was a great meeting and thank you all for inviting your panel guests. Uh, they all did an exceptional job and we really, uh, Rosie, if you would, please send the mayor letter from the minority caucus thanking him for attending the meeting and and to let him know that we'll be happy uh to to know the next date that he would be available to meet with us and if we wanted to have a specific schedule that he'd like for us to follow so thank you so much yes councilmember porter for that. Uh, Madam Chair, real quickly before we uh, dismiss, and again, thank you so much for a great productive meeting. I know the mayor mentioned the committee um, when he was talking about the chief diversity officer. He talked about the minority caucus putting forth a member of the caucus to serve on a committee uh, with him. And um, I, I was wondering if if we had an idea of who we may be nominated for that, and if you are open to suggestions for a person, um, I believe Councilwoman Toombs has some HR experience, if I uh, remember correctly. I'm not sure if we have any other caucus members that has HR experience, but the, the description um, from what he described, it, it sounded like uh, someone with some HR background could be possibly a good fit. So I just wanted to, to make sure that we um, remembered that he's asking us to uh, put forth a name from the caucus to, to serve in that capacity. Uh, for the diversity officer, and um, I know that Council Member Vercher has been working directly with um, um, HR and finance. Uh, in terms of that, and I also know that she was very instrumental with the uh, Equal Business Opportunity um, Bill that was passed. So, and, and her serving as budget chair uh, for the Minority Caucus, I would uh, think 
that um, currently for this year that she probably um, would would be the most likely candidate uh, from the caucus to to serve, uh, and and I don't want to um, dismiss anyone else participating or having the ability to 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 do so. Um, but I, you know, I don't also don't want this to turn into uh, more of a popularity contest as much as making sure that the familiarity of everything being there. So I would like to put forth, uh, for those reasons, I'd like to put forth council member virtue. And if you all have any problems with that, uh, please share uh, those concerns with me and maybe uh, we can have uh, a co person or vice chair or two vice chairs that can fill in because I know that Council Member Suara has also made um, um, made it known that she's interested in working with both the EBO and with these two uh, positions. And I know the two of them were on the budget committee and although I know that Council Member Toombs is very capable, but with her role as the Vice Chair of Budget Committee, we did not want to be any conflict of interest on her part uh, with her, you know, basically serving on the Budget Committee and just asked her if she would be ex officio, for which she did agree. So I don't know if you all would be uh, acceptable to that thought, but but I can just tell you that's my um, thought pattern for it. If you want to, we can take a, um, a vote on it now, or we can uh, discuss it later and make sure that we you know thoroughly reach uh, uh, a fair consensus of what it is that we're going to do moving forward. Thank you so much, Madam Chair. I'm fine with the will of the, the body, whatever it is that the caucus wants to do. Um, I'm, I'm more so just wanted to kind of circle back and bring it back to our attention that we needed to make sure that we had somebody, a name to present um, to the mayor. I think that uh, we are in a wonderful position that we have so many capable people that can handle uh, this position. So whomever the, the body chooses is, is absolutely fine with me, Madam Chair. I just wanted to make sure we circle back to that. Thank you. I thank you. I really do appreciate that because I did. I had completely forgotten about it because um, I started smelling this salmon and this broccoli that's being prepared. And uh, so I was kind of ready to to go at it. So thank you very much. Uh, Councilmember Gamble. Thank you, Madam Chair. And with that said, I, I make a motion that we discuss it at the next meeting uh, to give a little time to to review uh, interested candidates and, and give you time to enjoy your birthday for the rest of this day. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Anyone else, any comments or thoughts? Madam Chair, we're not going to have time. These positions go before the Silver Service tomorrow, and we're going to be looking to advertise these positions immediately. We won't meet again until next month unless you're going to call another meeting. Right, right, and and you're right. They do. They did. He did say that their civil service is supposed to meet tomorrow. So, uh, Madam Chair, yes. uh, uh, thank you for acknowledging my my um, interest and my work with the job description and all of that stuff. But I I would yield to your. Uh, recommendation and let uh, council member that should be the person. So I I am not interested. At least I pull my name out. So well, well, but but what I was thinking of is that we might have to have one or two people. I mean, have two people because just in case a time it comes where she may not be available to attend, you might need to be able to attend, and vice versa. That's that's the whole idea of having two 
that they only one can participate in the meeting at a time, but making sure we have someone who's interchangeable because I'd hate for us not to be at the table at any given time because one is not available. So that's why I was recommending a chair and a vice chair. And since you all basically serve as the chair and vice chair of the budget committee, it just made sense to me. Are you still are you still willing to do that, Councilmember Swar? Because Councilmember Porterfield added in Councilmember Toombs as a, a, a possible uh, person. Madam Chair, this is Councilwoman Toombs. I'm I'm fine with Councilwoman Birch and Councilwoman Suara handling it. See, that's what I'm talking about. You all are so cooperative, and it is just beautiful. Uh, so, Councilmember Suara, are you yes, still are you, are you are you still willing to participate, or do you yes, want? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Okay, great. Thank you very much. I really appreciate you all, and you all know that Councilmember Toombs is always uh, a good person to serve as a consultant and. She brings a wealth of knowledge uh, from a legal uh, uh, aspect that, that is most definitely needed in, as we move forward. So please utilize her uh, in questioning certain things as we move forward. So with that, may I have a motion to recommend Councilmember Vercher and Councilmember Suara as the chair and vice chair respectively for the positions moving forward with working with the civil service and the job descriptions. And I so move. Second. I so move, Madam Chair. Thank you. It's been properly moved and seconded. Is there any discussion or questions? There being none, all in favor say aye. 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 I need one more. Aye. Thank you very much. Any opposed? None post, so of course uh, it passes unanimously. Thank you all very night very much, and I hope you have a great night. And happy birthday. Happy birthday. Thank you. Happy, happy birthday. birthday to you. <laughs> Thank you. Enjoy the salmon. <laughs> Look. This has been a service of the Metro Nashville Network. If you would like to see this presentation again, or for more information about this and other programs, visit nashville.gov.